Okay. Good. Well, now this is going to be a fun one for me. John <laughs> Morris, I actually got you uh, where I want you in my <laughs> podcast. <laughs> How long have I known you, John? Oh, it's got to be 40 years. Yeah. Or 30 or 40. 30 right? at least, yeah. for sure. I think we met in Phoenix at the Doug Allard auction. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. right. We both looked a little younger and a little less gray. A little bit, yeah. Now, tell me just a little bit of background on you, because for people who don't know... Uh, I'm going to dig a little deep into you, but um, some of the things that you've done in your life are pretty crazy. In fact, let me just find out, where'd you grow up, John? I was born in New York City. Uh, I grew up all over the country because my father got called in the Army. So I did sixth grade in Alabama, North Carolina, and Texas. Wow. And I, well, I can't, decl- I can't declinate a sentence but I can tell you the five Indian tribes of Alabama, which is Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Creek. So uh, You were interested in Native American stuff even no, as a kid? No, that's because I remember, happen to remember that. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't get interested in Native American things until uh, I was a Boy Scout, 16, 18, something like and that. And what year would have that been? Oh, God, I have no idea. Okay, well, let me put it to you this way. How old were you? Uh, what year did you uh, graduate high school? I think in 58. 58. Okay. Yeah. So you're a little, about a generation of be before us. Oh, yes. Yeah. And um, so you grew up in New York, or but you had to travel all over because your dad was the in the military. Yeah. yeah. And did you avoid the military as well? I actually was lucky. I was declared one Y because I had migraine headaches. And the uh, psychiatrist in the uh, at the draft board said, what does your father do? And I said, well, he was the vice president of an ad agency until six months ago, and now he's a full colonel at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And the guy said, well, what do you think your father would say about you going in the Army? And I said, I think my father would say one of us at a time is enough. Yeah. He said, I agree, and uh, stamped me one line. Otherwise, you would have gone to NAM as well? I would have gone to Yeah, my brother went to NAM. Yeah. yeah. So... When you, so you grew up in, in all these different places because yeah. you're a military brat, basically. Yeah. And when you went out of high school, what did you do? I went to Carnegie Tech, uh, which had a great drama school. Uh, I went there in 59 and uh, stayed about a year and then talked to the guy who ran the school, Ted Hoffman, and he said, you're not really suited for being a student. If you want to be in the theater, go to New York. Here's the name of a guy who has a play running off Broadway. So he sent me to New York. And did you, so you graduated from Carnegie? No, no. I only stayed at Carnegie for a year. And he said, go on, this is and not I your think he made, If you want to do it, go be professional. So I wanted to be an actor, which I gave up. Yeah. Uh, but I started doing technical theater production stuff. And did you try the acting world though, when you went to New York? Oh, I sang and danced at a show called Leave It to Jane, being dragged around by Lainey Kazan with George Siegel playing banjo I mean, <laughs> about 30 times. Because I had no talent whatsoever, but I looked young. You looked young, so that was the most important thing. But, but you had wanted to be an actor. That really oh, yeah. was what you wanted that to do. That was what I was thinking And about what, when did you realize, okay, this is not going to work out as an actor? Were they the people saying, hey, kid, you're no, good looking, of, but maybe you want to do something else? Well, no. One of the first things I realized was every audition I went up to, there were probably 1,200, 1,500 you know, guys who looked exactly like me, who were in their early 20s and looked preppy, and I was just too much competition. So I started doing production. Of, of plays? Of, yeah. And how, how many years did you do that, or how I long did I did that, about three or four years, and uh, then I met the people from Beyond the Fringe, and I worked with them. They had a uh, show on Off-Broadway called The Establishment, which was a political, th- satirical uh, review from England, and uh, I ended up stage managing it. Then I bought it. Then I turned it in colleges all over the country. So, how old were you when you bought this production? Twenty six, twenty seven. And did you have? I mean, how did you come about having natural business skills for that? Because that's uh, kind just of a no idea. But I you knew that this was the right path. This you made could sense, just... and it worked really well for two or three years. We toured colleges all over the country. And then I had John Cleese worked for me for 300 mm-hmm. bucks a week. And, <laughs> As an actor, I assume. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because he was one of the English, uh, they had a thing called Cambridge Circus, which was another review. And I bought some of that material and I talked John into going out on the road for me. 
Oh my God! But then, so uh, John Cleese went around colleges doing your play, doing the play, yeah, doing the uh, establishment in Cambridge Circus. And then one year, my uh, my agent, a wonderful guy named Roger Forrest, who just died a couple of months ago, uh, said, "We got a problem. I can't sell the show in colleges. Political satirical theater is dead." Uh-huh. And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Well, look at look at the world. You got Harold Wilson in England." You've got Charles de Gaulle in France. You've got Lyndon Johnson here. You know, it is satire. Yeah. So, and this uh, is early 60s. Yeah. And uh, he took me to Toronto uh, to meet a guy named Bill Graham, who was running the Fillmore West. And Bill and I produced a uh, one week in the O'Keeffe Center in Toronto uh, of the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead. And that was just a whole beginning of a different direction. And were they starting just to take off? At they, that point in time? They were just really, I was 67. Yeah, they were really starting to, to move. It was a good move for them. And it's the first time anybody's ever done in a legitimate theater, uh, you know, the San Francisco music. And how did you get them to come aboard? How, I mean, because they were well, still fairly big names, right? Bill, was, Bill Graham was running uh, Fillmore West, and they were big bands in San Francisco. And so what we did was sell the idea of bringing the San Francisco sound to the East Coast. And you're still early, you're what, in your 20s? I was in my late 20s. Late 20s. Uh, in 67, I guess I was about 27. And uh, worked with Bill, did that show. First concert I ever did yeah. was 55,000 people in front of the Toronto City Hall for a freebie with uh, the Airplane and the Dead. And what were you? What was your job in that? I was the production manager. And so what does that, what does a production manager well, do? Well, I arranged the sound, the light, you know, got the bands, got a stage, uh, negotiated with the mayor and the police and the city people. I just produced a show. And basically. was that intimidating? Because that music was the hot music of the day and now you're oh, yeah. working with these bands and you're still, I'm sure you're a fan as well. Not as much. I mean, I, I looked at it as, this was a new kind of theater, and it made absolute sense. And because we were doing it in a theater, because we were doing it in the O'Keefe, you know, it, I was working with all the things I was used to, and we had a great show. It's a big deal. Then I went on tour with the airplane for five or six months. Yeah, tell, tell me about that. Well, great group of people. I mean, I, I remember one place in Ohio, I can't remember exactly where it was, but uh, one city after we'd been out on the road for about four months, Grace walked off stage and the audience was yelling for an encore. And she said, I am not singing White Rabbit again. <laughs> and I said, oh, come on. She said, no, I'm through. I'm not singing it anymore. Said, OK, fine. We'll never get out of here alive. But if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. And there were, you know, 10,000 kids out there yelling, white rabbit, white rabbit. <laughs> she finally folded and did it. So we survived. We got out. Yeah, that's hilarious. And, and so you worked with the plane, airplane for? Oh, about six or eight months. Uh-huh. Um, and then what happened from there? This is 68? Then we talked. Then I, got, I met a group of people uh, from Crawdaddy Magazine who wanted to open a concert theater in New York and had found a place called the Anderson Theater, which was down below what eventually became Fillmore East, but on 2nd Avenue and 4th Street. And we turned it into a concert hall. And we started booking concerts and bringing people in, brought Janice in. Janice Joplin? And, yeah. and you knew Janice, I oh, assume? Yeah. yeah. What was she like? Uh, she was crazy as hell, but she was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, she, the f- show she played for us, uh, the opening act was B.B. King. First time B.B. had ever played downtown in front of white, uh, you know, young white audience. This is 68? Uh, 60, yeah, 67, 68. Yeah. And we were trying to talk Bill Graham into coming into New York to do a film or raised. And we did this for about four or five months and finally got Bill to come in and try and do it. And uh, we talked him into it. We got a theater up the street and opened the film or raised. And so you had Janis Joplin, B.B. King, who else would have been... Oh, I think Blue Oyster Cult, who I oh. hated. Yeah, that's, uh, my wife will hate to hear that. She well, Maria Muldor. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Incredible Sting Band. Quite a few bands. I remember Peaches and Herb. We had two or three black act, good black acts. And I remember going into the box office, and Herb of Peaches and Herb was in the box office. 
And I walked in the box office door and he grabs his 45 and aims it at me because he's counting his share of the box office. So I learned, you know, as, <laughs> as things went along, you just dealt with it. That was all. And so, and, and the other people that were working with you at that time, how, who were they and how old were they? Well, most of them were about, I was about a year or two older, but it was a guy named Chris Langhart, who was the head of the New York University Theater Department, who became my technical director and worked with me for 20 years after that, and Joshua White, who had the Joshua Light Show. Uh, and they were involved in Toronto, and they were involved in the Fillmore East, and we all went to London together and did a concert hall in London called The Rainbow. We all worked on Woodstock together, so we were... And who was at The Rainbow? What, what, what bands the, did you, uh, did No, you? The Rainbow, we opened with a Who. Uh, huh. I had Mountain. Uh, my favorite Rainbow story is, uh, it's sort of a name drop, but uh, in my office, which was upstairs, my desk was a big piece, sheet of plywood, four by eight sheet of plywood. And Keith Moon from The, the Who was up there one night, uh, drinking a bottle of scotch, and we were talking, and we had Leon Russell playing on stage, and Mooney all of a sudden said, listen, that's Eric, and it was Eric Clapton, and Clapton had been off the face of the earth for two years, because that's when he would become a heroin addict for two years, and we went downstairs, down this circular staircase, and couldn't see Eric, but you could hear this guitar if you knew who it was. Yeah, you very distinctive. Him. And in the in the crook of Leon's piano was this guy wearing a navy watch coat and a, and a hat pulled down over his head, and it was Eric. And the first time he'd played in two years, it was wonderful. And he was playing for the Who. He was no, he was playing with uh, Leon Russell. He was doing with Leon yeah. Russell. Leon got him to come over and do it, and so he went back to playing. He cl he cleaned up. And uh, that was it, whole new career. Of, he's one of my favorite musicians. So. Uh, he's a genius for sure. Oh, love him, yeah. And so you do that for about five months? We, months? the Rainbow, well, we did, ran the film Maurice for about a year. Then I took the airplane and the Doors to Europe on a tour. What was that like to work with the Doors? Well, I had Jim Morrison die on stage on me once. Tell me about that. Well, we were in Amsterdam, and he found these people, and these people found him and gave him a brick of hash the size of his fist, which of course he consumed. Morrison was not very good about uh, being, you know, being careful about what he did. And uh, he went on, he was on stage in the middle of one of the songs and jumped up in the air, looked off the wings and said to Bill Siddons, his manager, and me yelled at us sort of, this is where I do my famous leap. And he went up and he came, went down and he just turned into a puddle. And so we, we thought he was dead. And we had to stop the show, pull him up, take him to the hospital, have his stomach pumped. He was sick as hell for a day or two, but uh, oh. Morrison was great. He was and great. So what did you, so how did you continue the show? Did you just, that's this, it, the whole show's that's over? It, that's simply? it. Well, the airplane were coming on afterwards, so the doors cut their short, set short, and uh, Ray and the rest of the band, Johnny and uh, the rest of them finished the set without Morrison. And we took Morris into the hospital, and his manager, Bill Siddons, went with him and uh, reported back that Jim was, in fact, going to live so we could <laughs> finish the tour. Now, he always used to wear this beautiful first phase concho belt around. Do you yeah, remember that? Yeah, a great one, yeah. And do you, you remember, do you, at that time when he was doing, did you have a clue what he had on, or it was just some Well, Indian I knew jewelry? what it was, but I didn't know how good it was. Actually, the other guy, Graham Edge, was the uh, drummer for the Moody Blues. And he used to wear two conch belts like bandoliers over his shoulders. And he loved them. Absolutely loved them. And so, that, that was kind of coming into vogue right at that time. Yeah. And of course, those guys are helped pushing it when you see them wearing, when you see on Jim stage. Morrison on stage, you know, hip yeah. as can be with a first face concho belt and the Moody Blues guy has his on. And so did any of that resonate at, at that point in time that you well, go? Well, I was interested in Indian stuff. I collected, from the time I was a Boy Scout, when I was about 16 or 17, I had started collecting Indian material. I went to the crafts counselor at this camp I was in and said, I want to make a pair of moccasins. And he said, what kind? There are 500, and gave me a book. So I started reading more and more of the books and getting into it. And I, had, I would buy, when I had a little money, I'd buy a piece of material. Yeah. 
So Morrison, he recovers from this. And what other great stories would you well, like to I share got even with Morrison? Morrison didn't play for us in the Fillmore East. He played out in Long Island. And he came in after the show. And I, I knew Jim pretty well. And we were talking. And he saw the lighting bridge that we had in the Fillmore East. And the way Chip Monk, who was the lighting designer, would get up to it was a bosun's chair. And Jim saw, you know, the way you'd get up a mast. And Jim said, oh, my father was in the Navy. I know yeah, about bosun's chairs. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he said, I know all about bosun's chairs. I've never ridden in one. And so we said, okay, you want to ride in one? So we put him in the bosun's chair and cranked him up and got him 60 feet in the air. And I l yelled up at him, I'm getting even with you for not playing for us. Tied the thing off to a chair. <laughs> and we went next door and had breakfast. And we could hear him in Ratner screaming, get me out of here, get me out of here. So we finally went and got him down. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that was probably a fairly even, though I'm not sure it even then no, was. Not exactly. Yeah, when was, you get a concert kind of a crash and you've got to take somebody to the hospital, that's a, that's kind of a devastating moment, right? Well, that's a bit of a surprise. Yeah, yeah a bit of a surprise, yeah. yeah. And so after you quit working with the airplane and the Who, what did you do after that? Uh, I went to, uh, I got approached to do Woodstock. Yeah, tell us about that. That's pretty amazing. In fact, it's funny, you know, I knew you for probably 15 years before I even knew you were on, were a part of Woodstock, I happened to be watching the movie. They were, and I go, I know that guy. That's John Morrison. How? What? What? And then you told the story. Well, it I wasn't mean, a big thing, but uh, I mean, it's, I didn't make a big thing out of it. No, you never did. No. Fifteen years, I knew you, and I never knew a word of it. No, the uh, Woodstock became came about because uh, the guys who came up with the idea of wanting to do it needed somebody who was a professional who'd been in the business for a while. And that was me, and they came over. I had left the Fillmore East, mm -hmm. and I was doing nothing. And they walked in the door and said, we're going to do this big concert in upstate New York, and we're going to have, you know, we, talk, we were talking in those days about 50,000 people. I mean, we had no clue we were going to get half a million. Uh, and I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. I said, fine, if I can bring my team. And I bought Chris and Josh and a whole bunch of other people. And we went and did it. And whose idea was it to do Woodstock? Who said, okay, well, let's take this pasture of land and do this? It was a guy named Michael Lang, who we called the curly-headed kid because he had Afro hair. Mm -hmm. He'd done one concert in Miami. Uh, he had a head shop in Miami. And his lawyer read an ad in the New York Times, which was taken by John Roberts and Joel Rosen, the, guy who put, the guys who put up the money for it, in the end. And the ad said in the Times, young men with unlimited capital looking for interesting investment. And what it really was, was they were thinking about doing a television series about two young men with unlimited capital and the crazy people who would come and talk to them and try to get them to put up money. Right. And Michael's lawyer, Miles Lurie, came up with, read the ad, and they set up a meeting. And Michael uh, came and shotgunned him with all sorts of ideas. We want to build a recording studio in Woodstock, and we want to do a festival thing in Woodstock. And Joel said, festival? What kind of festival? He said, well, you know, a lot of bands up there, and we'll get the bands to play, and it'll be good to push the studio. They were really pushing the studio. Mm -hmm. But John and Joel already had a studio in New York called Media Sound on 57th. So they got interested in the festival idea, and they said, you know, come, let's, let's do it. And festivals really weren't quite a thing at that no, time nothing, at all, right? Nothing, And what year was this? What time frame would have this, this been? This was in 69. Uh, 69. Yeah, well, late, well, April of, April, yeah, April, May of 69. And so John and Joel put up the money, which originally, you know, was a couple hundred thousand to start with. It mushroomed to... Well, the day after the festival, we were 2700000 in the hole in 1969. And so who put up all that money that that Well, lost? John John Roberts, God rest his wonderful soul, uh, who was an East Coast, uh, Yale, uh, Wharton School of Business, Philadelphia uh, businessman. He was a British champion, uh, but he put up the money for it. And when the festival was over... We didn't know about how much we'd sold in tickets. We had a room in the office that had about a million and a half dollars in checks in it for 18 bucks. Uh, they sold some of the film rights. But John, in a very Edwardian way, just said, I am not going to go bankrupt. 
He was the heir, along with his brother, to the Ipana toothpaste. It's disappeared now. Mm -hmm. But it was a major pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. And he just said, I'm going to pay every single bill. And he did. And they didn't make any money till about 10 years after the festival. So when this, so when they called you in, they had come up with the idea. They yeah. had funding by this individual who said, I'll put up the money. You had the space. You knew where you were going to go. And then what? Well, we didn't know where you, we were going to go. You didn't have it yet. We got kicked out of three sites. And why was that that you got kicked out? Because they knew they didn't want town, 50,000 young town kids. Town boards didn't, didn't want a whole bunch of hippies to... Right, and they were all hippies oh, at yeah. this time in 69. It's after the Tet Offensive. You know, Vietnam is raging. There's a lot yeah. of anger in the country. Uh, we've already gone through 68 with the Democratic debacle convention. Yeah. convention. And so it's very um, traumatic in the, in the country. Right. And so you had to go through three different... Three di well, first, the first place was Woodstock, who said no, yeah. the town board. And then we went to another place, and then to Wallkill, New York, and they just, the town board, you know, violated the Constitution and voted illegally not to let us assemble, blah, blah, blah. Right. And then this guy, Max Yasger, again, the New York Times. Max Yasger was a farmer, dairy farmer in Sullivan County, New York. Wonderful, sweet man. He had four or five heart attacks by the time he called up and said, Oh, I've got this big place, you know, you can come use it. And we went up and it was just ideal. It was perfect. Uh, and we were on that site for about 21 days. And that's where we put it together and did the festival. And so you you built a fence around the area? Is that, well, we... What was we, that? The, no, the one thing that was not terribly good was the, fe the fencing. We put in about 40 miles of underground water pipe dis distribution around the site. We built campsites. We built a big stage. We built all of that. The one thing we didn't get done in time, we had a contractor who didn't get the fences up in time. So the only way you could control, because when the people started coming, you would have people they there trying came. to take tickets or money, and, and you just got overwhelmed. Yeah, that was overdone. And so you were only expecting 50,000 at the most. 50,000 had been the number that the Beatles had drawn in Shea Stadium two years before. Monterey Pop, which was three years before, was 35,000 people in chairs over a three-day period in Monterey. But that's where Jimmy played and Janice and the rest of them. Uh, and we, uh, we didn't think... I had a bet with Mike, Mike Lang I, that I would pay him $100 for every 1,000 people. We got over 75,000. <laughs> so thank God he's never tried to collect it. So. But, uh, and who made all the arrangements for all those groups? Who decided the groups and who did I that? did the Michael and I did most of the booking. I knew most of the agents, uh, and I knew the people we had to talk to, and I knew what the price structure was. But, I mean, for instance, Santana and Joe Cocker, we paid $2,500 to because it was a big break for them, and it was the biggest payday they had ever had. And, of course, gigantic careers out of it. Oh, yeah. Hendrix got the most money of anybody. He got $35,000, but it was for two bands, for the experience, and he had a group called the Band of Gypsies. And uh, so we, he got 35 grand, but that was the biggest. And amount. how many groups were, how many groups played? How many oh, artists, think, do you remember? I think over three days, there must have been about 30 groups. And you had your hand in deciding all those. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid. And, yeah. and you say, I'm afraid, because why? Because it was... Well, no, it, it, it was an amazing show. Uh, Jeff Beck didn't show up. Uh, Iron Butterfly, who I didn't like anyway, I didn't book them, but they sent a telegram that said, we will, this is way before cell phones and any of that, they sent a telegram that said, we will arrive in LaGuardia Airport, you will send a helicopter, you will pick us up, you will fly us to the site, we will go on immediately, and the minute we're off, we'll fly back. And it was like, uh, okay. So I figured out with a Western Union lady, uh, how to send him a telegram back that read down F-U-C-K-Y-O-U. <laughs> and they, so they never got there. That was that was the end of that. But that was the first time Crosby, Stills, and Nash had played together. Uh, Who did you not get that you wanted? We didn't get the Beatles. We didn't get the Rolling Stones. I mean, we tried. We didn't get Dylan. Uh, those were the three main ones I would have loved to have had, but 
Yeah. And do you think those individuals, you probably talked to them at some point in time, regret not being at Woodstock? Um, I, well, the Beatles, I did McCartney's first tour after the Beatles. Uh, and no, they didn't, they were splitting up at that point and didn't want to do so it. I didn't, I was the Stones, we thought, were probably bad juju. We didn't want to do it, which is a mistake, because I worked with Mick later on, uh, planning the 72 tour for him. Uh, but, uh, and Dylan just didn't want to do it. Here's Dylan. Dylan did what he wanted to do, does it still, does what he wants to do. So you get everything organized, ready to go in 21 days, basically, which was yeah. probably, that's Insane. an undertaking on to sell. Yeah. And you've got 30 groups coming. They're going to show and up. And 300 at, people working in the field on building the, the field and the whole setup. And how many um, days were you planning on having the actual show? Well, three, and that's and, what we had. We opened on, actually, I took my crew out to dinner on Thursday night, and we came back, and it took the back roads from Route 8 in, in White Lake, which is about two miles away. And it took us about an hour and a half to get back because the roads were full. And this is the day before it opens? This is the night before it opens. Yeah. And actually, the first two words said, I had promised my mother years before that I would never swear on on microphone. And I walked up on stage, and there was a live mic there, and I saw about three, four hundred thousand people <laughs> where we were hoping to charge them to get in the next day. And I went, holy shit. <laughs> and about a half a million people laughed at me. Huh? So that's how those are the first two words said it would sound. So you had 300 people, 300,000 people who had not paid oh, yeah, we're that were third, already, already there. there. And how, the wor- how did the word get out? Because I know it got out. I mean, we had no cell phone. We had no internet. We had no social media. Underground newspapers mainly uh-huh. and word of mouth. Uh, we announced the festival about six months before, mm-hmm. and the under, there were no more underground newspapers. There was the East Village Other, there was the Avatar up in Boston, there were pa- you know papers in Dallas and in Tucson, and that's where we put most of the advertising money. And uh, it was just word. And it was 18 out. bucks for three days. For three days. Yeah. yeah. And so how did you, and how were you going to get the money? Were you trying to get it beforehand that they could send in or they were going to pay oh, at the door? Oh, they could buy pick, tickets in the mail. When we went back to the office after the thing was over, we had a room like this room that we're in now, and it was stacked up with thousands of checks for 18 bucks for three days. And that totaled about a million and a half by the time. And a good percent of those were not good, I'm sure. Well, no, I think the majority were (laughs) pretty good. good. Yeah, yeah. And so you open this thing on a Friday Friday morning. morning. Who's the first band? Uh, Richie Havens, first one I had laid my hands on. Yeah. Uh, Because we were packed solid. We couldn't move people in and out by car, which we'd planned to do. And at this point on Friday, was there 400,000 people? Because they kept streaming in, right? And at yeah. some point, they couldn't even get to the festival, well, right? Well, the, the, the state police after the festival showed me a satellite photograph hmm. where you could take an inch and count all the dots in the inch, which were people. And it shows that there were about two and a half million people trying to get in. Oh, my God. Yeah. So we were just, we were frozen. And I said to my wife, uh, Annie, go to the phone book and hire every single helicopter you can lay your hands on. And she did. We had 16 of them, including four Army helicopters by the time it was over. And that's how you'd bring the artists in. That's how we food, take medical people out, and bring the artists in. Yeah, because if you weren't already an artist there, you weren't getting in unless you had a helicopter. Yeah. And so who was there to They were all staying in hotels around the area. (coughs) So we had the helicopter, absolutely everybody in. And who came after Richie? John Sebastian. Because we got Richie because Richie had flown in. And I was standing on stage with Joe McDonald and, uh, of Country Joe and the Fish, who was an old friend. And uh, somebody said, here comes John Sebastian. And in this crowd of thousands of people down the road that went behind the stage, here's this guy, wasted as hell, in tie-dye from head to toe, John Sebastian. And he wasn't booked on the festival. So I just said to one of the stage managers, I said, go get it, bring him up. And they brought him up. And I said, John, would you like to, pay to play to a few hundred thousand people? Sure, man. I'll be happy to, you know, groovy, far out. We shoved him out. 
And then after he finished, uh, Joe McDonald went on on his own uh, because the band wasn't there. He was just there watching the other bands. And as I say, he was a good friend, always has been. And he and I had been in Europe together a few months before. And he'd said, you know, I think I really want to try a solo career sometime just to see what it's like. Like Woody Guthrie, play on my own. And I went, jo uh, Joe, guess what? Remember the conversation? <laughs> Here's your about opportunity. You're on. And he said, I need a guitar. So we got him a guitar. And he said, I need a capo to hold, you know, on the neck of the guitar. I didn't know what the hell a capo was. I thought it was an eviscerated chicken. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, I just yelled, somebody get me a capo. And we got a capo, and Joe went on, and he was the third act. And he's playing to 400,000 people maybe or yeah. more? Oh, yeah. And did it, did it change his trajectory as an artist? No. Yeah. They came back and played the set as Country yeah. Joe and the Fish, yeah. and there's the, the fish here in the middle of it. Uh, no, Joe was always, always a political person. And his family had been, his mother and father had been. Uh, and he hasn't changed a bit. I mean, he's still making music, he's still doing politics. He and Joni Baez used to be very political. Yes. And she gave her the money when she performed for me in London. She gave all the money to the War Resisters League. And, of course, the two people that everybody was in love with was Joan Baez and Grace Slick, because they were the beautiful singers and they were just staggering. And I had the pleasure of knowing them both. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And so who else played that first day at Woodstock? Ravi Shankar. Uh, we closed with Joan that night. Arlo Guthrie. Oh, wow. Uh, and all of a sudden, about the middle of the afternoon, when we were starting to get things moving, this guy in a saffron robe walks up to me and says, I'm with Swami Sasha Dananja, and he would like to speak to the audience. Could he speak to the audience? And I went... Can't do anything wrong. Why not? So he came with a whole bunch of acolytes, and they filled up the stage. And this guy with his high, squeaky Indian voice was just beautiful. Spoke to the crowd. He said, this is very peaceful. This is very beautiful. You must be happy. You must work together and enjoy this. And just help set the tone. He made a nice vibe oh, for beautiful. let's enjoy the music. Don't yeah. be... Uh, a goof and be careful yeah. with what you do. Just have fun. Yeah, have fun. And we had Which no we weren't having a lot in 69. There wasn't a lot of fun going on in a lot of ways. Well, Only this, in the music scene, really. In I the think. music scene, there was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and that was, I think, the thing that made it really work was the, the all the artists really enjoyed it. You know, uh, you know, Arlo Guthrie goes out and says, Hey, man, they closed the New York State Thruway. <laughs> Yeah, that's stating the obvious. <laughs> and I got, I got to say probably the most obvious sentence of all time. Uh, after, I think after Richie and after John, uh, I called the office and talked to John Roberts and Joel Rosamond and said, hey guys, I think I should be able to go up on stage and say that this is a free festival. Because it is. It's obvious. Yeah. You might as, we might as well state the obvious and have everybody on our side. So they said, yeah, you're right, go ahead, do it. And John kissed goodbye to a couple million bucks at that point. But I went out and said it and said, you know, this is now a free festival. And the, the audience cheered. And yeah, that's in the movie, the I believe, if I correct. I think that's when I recognize you and go, <laughs> John yeah, Morris. That's John, yeah. Um, actually, Wadley, who made the movie, I mean, has made a lot of woods. The fact that the, the uh, documentary was is the greatest grossing documentary of all time. They won a couple of Academy Awards for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that helped make the whole Woodstock thing work. Yeah. And so day one, you survive. Yeah. Now you're into the weekend. Put everybody to bed with Baez singing uh, Ave Maria, I think. Uh -huh. And I told everybody, I, I had not planned to be the announcer, uh, but Chip, who was the lighting designer, and Wavy Gravy from the hog farm and I, started doing it because the first we'd hired some DJs from from New York mm -hmm. and they were all doing hey groovy guys and gals the next thing is <laughs> like oh this is wrong <laughs> so we canned them and then we did it ourselves yeah much better off and so you probably got little to no sleep the first night 
I don't think I got any sleep over the whole week, and yeah. not much. And so the next night, next day, who starts the, the day two off? Do you remember? Oh, gosh, I don't remember. Uh, probably Keith Hartley or Quill. We had some spo- Oh, and then um, what was Bruce Glattman's band? Um, Summer's Day or something like that. And, ha- and who played on that second day? Do you remember? Well, any Crosby, of- Sills, and Nash played. Uh, the Airplane played. Uh, uh, Country Joe and the Fish played the second day. Uh, the Grateful Dead played the second day and were terrible. <laughs> Hated it. They were just off. Yeah. They played a bad set. And you're bringing them in and out as with the helicopter. We, yeah, one as, comes in, next one goes out. You're right. And, and they're coming in from New York? Uh, they're coming in. No, they were staying in the area in Sullivan County. I see. Because there are lots of traditional old Jewish hotels. The Concord, Grossingers, the rest of them. It's been a summer place for the Hasidic community for years and years. And uh, so we just bring them in and get them on as soon as we could. I mean, Shanana didn't go on until the sun was coming up. Wow. Uh, and their manager was going crazy. And they looked fabulous and it probably gave them a couple more years. Uh, and was there a time rank? Were they supposed to do like a 40 minute set or an? Something like most that. everybody did 45 to an hour. Uh-huh, but some just kept going? Some, just, some went longer. Some went, the, the dead, did, who usually would play forever and ever, did not. Huh. Uh, they just were really off, and they were out of tune. Crosby, Stills, and Nash, it was the first major gig they'd ever played. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Yeah. Uh, first major gig they'd ever played. Uh, and they were out of tune for the first two or three numbers. It was just terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But everybody may do. Everybody made it work. And some of those, some of those artists must just have fed off that like crazy to have five hundred thousand people oh. by that time screaming and chanting. Well, Santana and and, and Joe Cocker, yeah. two bands that had never played for more than maybe a thousand people, all of a sudden they're playing to a half a million people, and they whipped it. They were great, yes. both of them. And when did the rain start? Well, it was drizzly. It started on Friday. It yeah. was drizzly on Friday, and then it started some more. It rained during the day on Saturday. Um, and you had lightning and stuff in the area too, right? We had actually on Sunday afternoon, we had a tornado go through. Oh my God! Forty mile an hour winds and a tornado, uh, right after Cocker played. Uh, What's and, that like for you? Because you're involved with all the stages, all well, those big towers, and you must have just been going out of your mind. Probably as close to a nervous breakdown as I've ever come. I was on stage with Mike Wadley with a camera pointing up at me. I had just been told that my wife had uh, fallen and broken her ankle, that Mm -hmm. Joni Baez had had a miscarriage, that my dog was missing, and I've got a mic in my hand that's shocking me in the hand. And it's just Wadley and me on the stage with this stage roof, which was a a real mistake, uh, flapping all over the place. And I didn't know whether to kiss him or kick him, you know. But huh? Wadley and I became very close in that sequence. And there was people climbing the poles to get better views, and you have well, electricity. Well, I had to get, ask everybody to get off the towers because the towers were about 50 feet high, and there were super troopers, the spotlights on the top, and they weren't chained. Yeah. And one of those things drops on somebody. It was 200... 250, 300 pounds, those things. Didn't, thank God. We yeah. were very lucky. Yeah, I mean, you could have had a major oh. disaster. Yeah. So you make it through day two, yeah. and uh, people are probably still swarming in. It's still, yeah. and at this point, maybe you're starting to run out of food. You need medical things going on too, right? And you're, right. that's also under well, we your purview. We flying people right? out to hospitals and flying supplies in. On the Sunday, there's a sequence in the film where... I'm standing on stage and talking to the audience. We had a guy actually, there's an old New York thing where Fiorello LaGuardia, who was the mayor in the 30s, who my dad worked with, he used to read the funny papers on Sunday mornings. And there was this kid who was one of the ushers from the Fillmore who was working for us, whose name was Mole. And Mole came to me and said, I'd like to read the papers to the audience. And I said, sure. (laughs) So he did that Sunday morning. Then Sunday afternoon, it got hotter than hell. Mm-hmm. And I was about to get, we had a couple of fire engines on site, and I was about to get the fire engines to spray, spray the audience. Yeah. And then the rain came up really heavy with Cocker, and this tornado came in, and it just soaked everybody. And that was Sunday? That was Sunday. And then we figured what we ought to do is we got to keep going. And we thought we'd go into the night 
which is how, why we held Jimi Hendrix off, uh, so that we didn't have you know a whole bunch of people moving in the night, but they moved in the night anyway. I mean, Hendrix only played to maybe you know a piddly little thirty or fifty thousand people, and that was toward the very end. Uh, that was this Monday morning. The sun was up or coming up, and he started the start. I had gone back to my trailer <laughs> and to lie down because I was once I got him <laughs> on stage, I thought I, that's it, I'm done. Uh, let, had him on stage and lay down and went out like a light and woke up when he started playing the Star Spangled Banner. Oh my gosh! And he was the most uh, well paid of all the. Uh, yep, yeah. and he was. He, it was just amazing. He was great. And everybody else, and at that point, so that's Monday morning. People are starting to get out of there. They oh, got to, most of the people are gone. They've got to, they've got to get back to their homes. They have to and, go to work. Yeah, or they tell their parents that they're over at their friend's house for the. I'm sure there was a lot of those. And who was played on Sunday? Cocker played. Cocker played. Uh, Jimmy played. Um, Paul Butterfield. Uh, there was a jam session with members of Country Joe. And John Dinsmore, actually, who was the uh, drummer of the Doors, had come. And uh, some of the members of the Dead. But that was, that, was, that was where Barry Melton, who was the guitarist for Country Joe, came up with the No Rain, No Rain chant. He, later on, he's retired now, but he was a judge in Marin County. He was oh a gosh. lawyer and became a judge. Oh, my God. Quite a bunch of people. Really interesting. And so Sunday, so Monday morning, you it's over. It's it. At That's least it. that part's over. And then you have the ramifications of what. Well, the first thing happened. I did, I I heard Jimmy play the Star Spangled Banner. I went to, back to sleep for about an hour, and then I got up and I walked the whole site because I was afraid I'd find somebody who was dead, dead or injured or yeah. something else. And it looked like a Matthew Brady photograph. I mean, it was yeah, just the Great insane. Civil War photograph. And thank God, no, Nothing. nobody hurt. So yeah. we started cleaning it up. And so you had people that would do that? You'd hired people? Or? Oh, yeah. We probably threw... Well, we had a crew of about three, 400 people. We probably threw away thirty or 40,000 uh, sleeping bags soaked with mud. Thirty or 40,000. And then we had a truck, a couple of trucks, like an 18-foot sta uh, steak bed that was full of sandwiches that people had made to send to the people, but the people were gone. Yeah. So we sent it to a couple of the local hospitals. But it was it, it was amazing. And how long did it take you to clean that up? We were there on site for about a month. Cleaning up, wow. But six months later, it was the most beautiful field you've ever seen. It was yeah. just great. Grass grown. Have you ever all... gone back and visited? Oh, yeah. yeah, once or twice, yeah. And do you get a deja vu when you go there? Is it an odd no. feeling? No. No. Not, not yet. I don't do drugs. Yeah. I never did. <laughs> yeah. So when did the ramifications of, oh my God, this was a financial failure, really start to fall out? Within about a week. Yeah. We had to really scrape and scra scramble. And John was over, a, John Roberts was over a real barrel. But John and Joel just sat down and said, you know, we're going to pay it off. We're going to make it work. And I happened to have a great guy who was my lawyer in those days, uh, Chuck Seaton, uh, who was must have been in his 60s at that point, the nicest man in the world. And I called him, I'd actually lost my share I'm sure. of a hotel in the Virgin Islands that weekend because mm -hmm. my partners met illegally in New York <coughs> and voted me out of the company. And Chuck was at the meeting and he said, uh, <coughs> you could sue them, but they're the Jones and Laughlin Steel Company. So you're not going to win. So you lost that deal. Woodstock cleaned you. Yeah, well, Woodstock I got paid for. I got paid $15,000 to do Woodstock. You did? Yeah. <laughs> and it was just the first number that came to my head when they said, how much you want? Um, but Chuck went and went to work for John and Joel and started digging out, made the, made the deal with Warner Brothers to get them a million. We had the million and a half that we had in uh, checks and... And so where do you go from there? You've done Woodstock. It's a pretty good resume to it have was, done. Well, but yeah, it just felt weird. Uh -huh. For about a year, I think most of the people were heavily, heavily involved in it. There was like nothing you really wanted to do that fit. Um, so I went to England. I got out of the country. And just recuperated? Well, started the Rainbow Theater. Uh, raised the money to do that and have my own theater in London. My wife was English. I love England. I've lived there maybe 
15, 20 years of my existence. And uh, so we did it. And then after the Rainbow Theater in England, what do you, where do you go? Uh, Paul McCartney, toured Paul McCartney in 72. And With, he was Wings at that point? That was Wings Over Europe, yep. And what was that like? It was interesting. Yeah, I can see it in your mind. <laughs> well, he got, uh, in, we were in Gothenburg, Sweden, and I was doing the box office settlement, and all of a sudden I looked out the window, and there was a tank outside. What the hell's a tank doing here? And it was the Gothenburg, Gothenburg Sweden drug, drug squad come to bust Paul, because Paul had called his office in London and said, we're running out of grass, send us some grass. <laughs> and his stupid secretary took a handful of grass, stems and all the rest of it, put it in an envelope and sent it to Paul McCartney Park Hotel, <laughs> Gothenburg, Sweden. Shortly there, followed by the drug squad. And uh, they said, we're here to arrest Mr. McCartney and his band. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. Um, can you let him go back on stage and play the encore? They said, sure. And the guy who was the head of the thing was a really nice guy. Uh, and I said to my partner, Jean-Claude Kaufman, uh, give me the, give me the uh, briefcase with the money in it. And I went with McCartney and Linda afterwards. And Linda started screaming, I'm an American citizen, I want the ambassador. And I said, shut up. And so we went to the police station and they charged them all. And they said, it'll cost you about $40,000 in bail, which I paid in about six different currencies because I had, you know, Gilders and uh -huh. uh, Krona and uh, Deutschmarks and uh, Pounds. And I, Lynn is still screaming, get me the ambassador, get me, I'm an American citizen. And I said to the guy who was there, the drug squad, forgotten his name, nice guy. By then we were friends. And uh, I said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you 10,000 more if you'll keep her. He said, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't get her out of here in the next five minutes, I will charge you twice the amount of bail. Yeah, you were afraid they would, it was going to really go bad. <laughs> no, but he just wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to put up with her. So we got them all out and they went on bail. And Paul went back six months later. And, and so how long did you work with him? And you were, were you doing the whole arranging yeah. of the areas and the. We did that? 38 dates in 38 concerts in 48 days. Wow. wow. From Turku, Finland to Joan Lapin in the south of France. And so what did you do after McCarthy, after Paul McCartney? Uh, Charles, if you check I the moved camera. to the Caribbean. Uh -huh. <laughs> to an island called Mustique and lived on that. So, and how long did you live in the... In a year. The For somebody who had made, you know, somebody once is a, having a, di at a dinner party at my house, I got up to go get something out of another room. And he said, oh, there goes John to phone himself off again. I made two phone calls in an entire year. That was it. <laughs> so, and then came back to New York. And, and then when you came back to New York, when was this? What time frame would this have been? Must have been 76, 77. 76. Around then. Yeah. And I was there for a while, and then I came to Santa Fe. In that, uh, in that time frame? Yeah. I, well, the I, first time I came to Santa Fe was... 1969, because a friend of mine had said, you have to go to Santa Fe and meet a man named Lloyd Kiva Nu, mm -hmm. who was the head of the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I brought 25 kids to Woodstock from uh, the school. And that was the beginning of my really being involved. Lloyd and I became great friends. And I've heard I only great things me. about this man. I used to say to people, the best favor I can ever do you is I will introduce you to my friend Lloyd Kiva Nu. He was a wonderful man. And so at this point, you have, in 69 is when you first came to Santa Fe, but in 76 when you actually come here, do you move here? I, I moved here. Uh, we had an idea to do a Woodstock Town Festival out in Mora. Hmm. That would have uh, been interesting. In the, in the country. And uh, we didn't do it. I finally woke up to the fact that I didn't want to be in the music business anymore. And so at that point, you said, okay, I'm doing something else? Yeah. And what did you do? Uh, I started doing uh, Kim Martindale's Indian show. <laughs> Is that when it started? Yeah. Well, I didn't realize it was that I, early. He was, oh yeah, no, he was in the early 70s. Kim's done this for 35 years. Yeah. It's uh, even longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's a mere tad child. Yeah, he was. And uh, I just started doing the shows. I had one partner was Bruce... Ben Landingham, mm -hmm. who just died, which is a shame. Yeah, I heard and the that. other is was uh, Dale Heineman, uh, who's not dead, but he's now the uh, trout fishing 
real estate man for the state of New Mexico. Uh, and I decided I hated being in a booth. I liked the material, but I hated being in the booth. I didn't like to sell. And I looked around and thought, you know, you've been producing events all of your life. Just do a different type of venue. Just do venue. a different type. So we did it. And so you've done art shows. You've done Native American shows. Antique since, shows. Since 77? Sometime around there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost 25 years. And now you and Kim are working on many different well, shows. Well, we have the two shows here. The Aussie Sub Art Fe, Show yep, in Santa Fe. Which is why I'm here. And the Antique American Indian Art Show, which is the only really true Indian antique show left. And uh, we do a show in San Francisco in February called the uh, San Francisco Tribal and Textile Art Show, which I'm having great fun with. Yeah, that's Lots a great Lots of dealers venue. with African material and New Guinea material and in Fort Mason in San Francisco. I love it. And so the show that we have that I'm here for, which I've been exhibiting, it's a great show, and we're doing a Maynard Dixon exhibit actually for it, and we're doing, an, uh, you have another great exhibit for Mira and George Nakashima, and I, if you could just talk about them a little bit. I've always been a fan of their furniture, and you happen to, to know I Mira. was connected to them in a strange way, but uh, George Nakashima was uh, one of the Japanese people who got interned on the West Coast during the Second World War. He had an architecture degree from MIT. Uh, he had done architectural work in India and a couple of other places. And after he was, he got out of there, a friend of his in New Hope, Pennsylvania said, I've got this land and you can have it. And I think you should do some of the woodworking that you were doing when you were uh, in the internment camp. And he turns out to be, I mean, it's this, the leader of the American crafts movement in furniture and using big flat logs and yeah, the very butterflies. organic oh, imagery. Very organic. Yeah. I mean, one of his one of the books George wrote is called Soul of a Tree, and Mira was his only daughter, and I don't think she ever stood a chance, but she just became an apprentice to her father, uh, became an architect designer herself, and is uh, George was honored by the state of Pennsylvania about 15, 20 years ago as a living treasure in the state of Pennsylvania, a crafts artist person. And Mira is accepting exactly the same award 20 years later on the night before the show opens. Yeah, so just in a couple of days. Yeah. And how did you meet George? Uh, I met George because uh, two good friends of mine who had restaurants in New York that I helped them with at one point. I worked for them. Uh, Abe and Alin de la Husse. He's a Cajun chef. He had a restaurant called La Louisiana on Lexington. And then I helped him get another restaurant called Tex Arcana. And I became the major D for a while, but I didn't know what I was doing for a bit. And what years uh, would this have been that oh, you started? I don't remember. Nineties? Some eighties. Eighties. Uh, and yeah, because I was between here and there a lot. And uh, Alin is was George Nagashima's cousin. And so I met George and I met Mira and both their daughters who I the godfather to were married down in New Hope at the uh, at the where the workshop is. Mm -hmm. And when George died in the nineties, uh, Mira kept on going with the business. And then another angle, Linda Milanese, who is the executive director of Assistance Dogs of the West, who's who we're doing the cocktail party for, uh, was at the James Michener Museum. And she started working with Mira, and they knew each other. And the other person who knows him is Bill Graham's widow, uh, Bonnie McLean, lives in Bucking Buckminster. So all these people know each other. And we just bumped into each other, and we talked about, Mira and I have talked about doing a Nakashima uh, exhibit for years. And we just sort of went, this year. And then you have... You know, you've been working, you and I have been working since, uh, well, the first time we met, I think I showed you a paper and showed you an auction in Tucson and said, should I go to it? You said, well, they always have one piece. If you can snag the one piece, which I did, I still thank you for, uh -huh. uh, it's worth it. But it's that kind of, you know, little circle of people. Yeah. Uh, you came and did one of our shows in the Sweeney Center and did something we've always both wanted to do, <laughs> was to have one Georgia O'Keeffe in a booth. Yeah. 
And you sold it afterwards. I always wanted to do something where it would just have one object. One object and that's me it. too. <laughs> yeah. And now we've got all these great Maynard Dixons, one of my favorite painters of all time. We've got the Maynard Dixon paintings mixed in with the Nagashima furniture. Which is the first, I think. First time. Two. Yeah. And I keep thinking these are three artists who never met each other. Probably but not. But they loved each yeah. other. Now, Dorothea yeah. Lange might have known George because she might have mm -hmm. taken photographs of George in the internment camps because she did that. Yeah. So it's possible that she would have met they him or even, each other. Yeah, or even been photographed. He might yeah. have even been photographed by her. And Could of course, Dixon and Dorothea Lange were married from 1920 to 1935. And so there may be that connection. We don't even, well, yeah, there is we'll the connection, yeah. but we don't know if they don't actually exactly win. But to have these great Maynard Dixon paintings against oh, the Nakashima. Oh, with the furniture, it's fabulous. Furniture. Yeah, and I'm such a fan of the furniture. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, it's an honor to have those in there with uh, those you know, being in the same breath of those furniture. is just Well, amazing. for me, it's a pleasure because we try to do an interesting exhibit every year. You gave us a great exhibit last year. And when I said to you, we're going to do Nakashima, you said, I'm a fan, I'll bring Maynard Dixon yep. paintings. So yep. I couldn't ask for any kind of better exhibit. So me. we brought up the Maynard Dixon Museum. I'm going to give a lecture August 11th, which will be at 1, and then Mira's going to give a lecture 12th. on the 12th. Saturday, at, Sunday, at, rather. Yeah, at the tw on the 12th. On Do we know what time she's talking? I think it's, I think same time I as think it's 1. So All the, the 11th, you can hear one. about Mira, or uh, Maynard Dixon, and then on the 12th, you can hear about Mira and George Nakashimi. Yep. And, uh, Wander through, look at the paintings, see the furniture. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's really a remarkable show. And, and you, I, I, you know, getting to hear the backstory of how you ended up in the antique world, Indian world, I mean, it's a really circuitous route. Well, it's about the same as the music business. A lot of people who are brighter than most, which makes it interesting, who don't necessarily play well with others, but uh, are really interesting, fascinating people. And there's art. Yeah. Would you do anything differently? You've done so nah. much. Yeah, you like it. I'll be 80 this coming May. If I get run yeah. over by a truck, I've had as good a life as anybody else. So you are kind of, you're kind of working on a book, maybe, right? Yeah. yeah. Working on a book with Walter Borton, who's one of my very good friends. Yeah, so. And the lady I live with now, uh, Luzanne Fernandez, who's a lawyer, uh, came up with the title Recollections of a Rock and Roll Relic. And this is, this is copyrighted, folks. Don't take it. <laughs> So you can look for John Morris in the future, hopefully in a book, which I would read in a heartbeat. And you've had an amazing life. You've met so many interesting people. I've been lucky. Them. Yeah. Bumped into the right places at the right time. And do you think that's what it is? Do you look at it as luck? No. No. It's hard I work, just, right? Walter paid me, Walter who's writing the book with me, paid me one of the greatest compliments I think I've ever had. And I think it's, it was a description to somebody of me. And he said, John has always looked to see what's next. He's never looked back. And I've looked back, but I've never dwelled in the past. So, but I've had a great time. Yeah, I think, you know, if you if you dwell in the past, you're gonna miss all the future. You're gonna miss all the fun. Yeah, yeah. and you definitely have not missed the fun. No. <laughs> uh, so if you come to the show, come see John, say hi to John. He'll, uh, he'll be running around. The gray-haired guy in the, in the red cart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And man, it's a thrill to have you and just get to talk My to you pleasure. for a period of time. It's I mean, I've known you as a friend and as a promoter and all this, but it's always good to get the backstory and kind of understand where it all comes from. Well, and it's... now I know it. Now you know. And everyone else does too. Yeah. John Morris, thank you so much. My pleasure, Mark. All right, I'll get you back thank to work. You. All right. Okay, yeah, I go back, finish it off. Yeah, now he's got to go back and set up another show. <laughs> <laughs> John Morris.